Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Lots to bring you tonight. I recently spent some time in England, and I had an opportunity to sit down with a great defender of human rights, human life, and human dignity, David Alton, a member of the House of Lords in the U.K. I spoke with him about religious freedom around the world, particularly in North Korea, but we had a wide-ranging conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. And later, we'll take a look at the growing human rights issue here in the United States and abroad, human trafficking. If you think it only happens in the third world, think again. Director of Special Projects at the U.S. Bishops Committee on Migration and Refugee Services, Natalie Lumert, joins us to talk about the multi-billion dollar industry that destroys the lives of children and adults right here in the United States and what you can do about it. And finally, we're joined by a woman who found spiritual healing after a sexual assault. Dr. Marguerite Ogden will share her moving story of survival and hope through faith in our final segment. As always, I want you to be part of the program. You can drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com or tweet me at Raymond Arroyo. Now, let's get right to it. He's been at the forefront of religious freedom and human rights all around the world. He's a crossbench peer in the UK House of Lords, representing his native Liverpool. I sat down with him recently at his offices in Parliament to talk about his work in the House of Lords, the state of freedom in North Korea, his recollections about the late Margaret Thatcher, and much more. Here's my exclusive interview with Lord David Alton. Take a look. Lord Alton, thanks again for inviting us back here into Parliament. It's, it's such a joy to see you again here. Let's talk for a moment. In 1997, you stepped down. You left your seat as an MP, uh, primarily because the Liberal Democrats, the party with which you were aligned, um, they had made abortion a central priority. Was that primarily the thinking? It was, and it went, Raymond, right back into my own youth, because when the original legislation went through in 1967-8 uh, to legalize abortion in this country, as a boy at school, I'd campaigned against that and collected petitions. Mm -hmm. And I joined the old Liberal Party, and of course, Britain and America are divided by a common language, as yes. they say, uh, and it, liberal in the British context didn't mean what liberal in the American context means. And of course, Churchill had been a member of the British Liberal Party right. before he became a conservative, Mr. Gladstone and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very tiny party in those days. Mm -hmm. But because uh, abortion mattered to me as an issue, I wrote to the then leader and said, is this a matter of conscience or is it a party policy? And it was a matter of conscience. And so throughout the years that followed, I became chief whip of the Liberal Party and its home affairs spokesman and in many other capacities, chairman of its policy committee and so on. And I was always able to hold the views that I held about abortion and no one ever challenged my right to hold those views. But after I introduced a bill in 1987 to reduce the number of abortions in the UK, of which we have 600 every single working day, mm -hmm. uh, the party, which by then had changed, it had amalgamated with the Social Democrats and become the Liberal Democrats, they decided to make abortion a matter of party policy. Uh -huh. And I said that was a red line issue for me, which I couldn't cross, and that if that was to re remain a uh, a policy, then I would step down as a member of parliament, would not be willing to fight again at the next general election. So that's what I did. Mm. But I was surprisingly given a new lease of life because the then right. prime minister, John Major, offered me the chance to serve in the House of Lords, our upper house, which mm. isn't an elected house, it's an appointed mm. house. And so I was allowed to come to the Lords as an independent. So I sit on the, what's called the cross benches. Yeah, the cross bench peer. And that has sort of liberated you from the party politics. Has that been a, lease, a new lease on life, has it been liberating for you? Well, I kicked off the dust from my shoes when I left here, Raymond, like a mm -hmm. prisoner getting out of the penitentiary <laughs> and found myself given a life sentence um, because it's a, a life appointment. Mm -hmm. But at one level, yes, of course, it's a, a liberation from party politics, but it's also an enormous privilege mm -hmm. and an opportunity still to be the sort of bit of grit that gets in to make the pearl emerge from the oyster. I mean, mm -hmm. being bits of grit in the system is what I think we're all called to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, I get the chance still to pursue issues close to my heart, which are 
well, the traditional Catholic issues, if you like, of human rights, human life, and human dignity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and certainly abortion and all of these life issues. And we'll talk about the new euthanasia bill moving through the parliament. I want to back off for a moment and talk about North Korea. Uh, human rights has long been a focus of yours, uh, you and uh, Baroness Cox and others. Um, tell me how North Korea landed on your radar. Well, it's eight years ago, Raymond, since a North Korean who was due to come and see Caroline Cox, Baroness Cox, she was out of town. And I got a call from her office to say, would I see a North Korean defector who was coming in that day? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't know anything about North Korea. And the young man said to me, well, no one knows much about North Korea, it's, so it's that's all right. It's a pretty isolated <laughs> country. So I agreed to see him, and I was powerfully moved. He had seen his wife and two children die in the famine. Two million people died in the 1990s in mm. North Korea. And then he lost his other boys. He tried to escape. And only a year ago, I went out to northeast China and went to the uh, River Tumen, which is the river that he had crossed, and where many people are shot dead as they try to escape. He's been going in and out in all the intervening years, helping other people to escape. And as he told me his story, he said, what can be done? What can you do for us about this? Mm -hmm. And I was going to tell him that I'm not the Prime Minister or the Foreign Secretary, and I thought, I can't tell you all the things I can't do. I thought, at least I can try and get a debate here in the House about human rights and security issues in North Korea. I got the debate, and as a result of that, got a phone call from uh, the North, North Korean, Korean ambassador, ambassador. Who was not terribly pleased with your efforts. He wasn't, and actually, Raymond, he told me I've been speaking to too many Americans. <laughs> and, look, and look at you now. Exactly. <laughs> but I told him I hadn't spoken to any Americans, but I had spoken to a North Korean. Who was that? He said, and I said, well, I'm not saying that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I said, you never allow anyone into your country anyway. So how would I know whether what I was told is mm. true or not? Okay. So he said to me, would you go? And I thought, yeah, would I come back? <laughs> That's <laughs> um, the big question. <laughs> but I said, well, if I could pay my own way, if I could travel with a colleague, if we could draw up a report on what we see and what we observe, and if we have the right to challenge on human rights cases and questions, mm -hmm. I said, and we have a British ambassador in North Korea, because of course we ended the war 12 years ago. America is still technically, of course, mm -hmm. 60 years after even only next week will be the 60th anniversary of the armistice on the Korean Peninsula. So three million people died in that war. Uh, I said, we will know if this is being used as a propaganda exercise or not. And in fairness to him, uh, and he's now a minister in North Korea, he was as good as his word. And so Lady Cox and I went and we took with us a young Catholic called James Maudsley. James had been 18 months in solitary confinement in Burma, where he'd been to campaign on behalf of Aung San Suu Kyi. So the three of us went, and I then came back. We formed the Parliamentary Committee on North Korea, and eight years have passed. And in that time, we've raised many human rights cases, had many hearings. And what is the situation? What did you observe there? Because so few people, I think, have an appreciation, and because it's a closed society, of what happens, not only the human rights situation there, but it is routinely identified as one of the greatest religious persecutors in the world. Well, of course, religious freedom was at the very top of our agendas. Mm -hmm. And Caroline and I took the opportunity of visiting the only permitted Catholic church in the country, though no priest has been permitted in 60 years. But there is a service there on Sundays which we attended. I was even on my last visit allowed to speak to the congregation mm -hmm. uh, and to give them Bibles, and, and which I brought into the country, theoretically, illegally, uh, but I was allowed to. And I was able also to bring some pictures of Pope Benedict. And, and these are people who have been completely out of touch with the universal mm. church. So it was possible to do something. It was also evident to me that people still suffer grievously for their faith. We visited a place called Anju, which is north of Pyongyang. And I asked if there were any churches. We were told no, of course. Um, but the mayor told me that there was a Catholic church here. And she, it was one of those rare moments where you learn something that you hadn't anticipated. She said, but they meet in the rubble of that church every week. And I said, what, for the last 60 years? Yes, every week for the last 60 years, these believers had been meeting without priests, without sacraments. Mm -hmm. And that reminds us, of course, that there have been 8,000 Catholic martyrs in Korea since they themselves brought the faith to Korea. John Paul II said it was a church unique in the history of mm -hmm. Christianity because it was Koreans who themselves brought Christianity into Korea mm -hmm. and they lived without priests for the first 50, 60 years really of remarkable. their existence. Really remarkable. St. Andrew Kim, of course, only 25 years old, was the first Korean Catholic priest and he's the proto-martyr. Mm -hmm. You have written 
North Korea is in many ways the victim turned perpetrator of systemized abuse. How has that happened and how has the West misread the situation in North Korea? Well, in, in the book I've just published called Building Bridges, Is There Hope for North Korea? I, I use that phrase because mm -hmm. I, one of the things we've misunderstood, I think, about the Korean Peninsula is how they suffered under Japanese occupation from the turn of the 20th century until the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Stephen Kim, who was the Catholic cardinal who stood against the military dictatorship in South Korea, his own family uh, had suffered under Japanese occupation. Uh, there had been martyrs who had died for the faith during that period. Churches were raised to the ground. The Korean language was banned. Women were used as so-called comfort women. Uh, women were regularly raped by Japanese who were there. And of course, Japan has never accepted its role during that period. So this is a source of great grief in, in Korea. And it doesn't take long if you start to talk to any Korean, North or South, before that period of history is remembered. And I would argue that the very things that were done to Koreans during that time that the communists did in the North and the military dictatorship did in the South to their own people during the period that followed. So the victims became perpetrators. And in South Korea, remember, it was a Catholic, Kim Dae-jung, who became the Nobel laureate, mm -hmm. who spent six years in prison. There were assassination attempts against him. Uh, he was an incredibly brave man. Uh, and his wonderful wife, Lee Hee-ho, is still alive. She's a Methodist. And she was totally supportive of him throughout the whole of his time in prison, as was Cardinal Stephen Kim, who said at one point when the military dictatorship wanted to arrest all the protesters, they'd taken refuge in the uh, Catholic cathedral in Seoul. Uh, he stood at the doors and said, you can have the protesters, but first you take me, hmm. then the Reverend Fathers, then the sisters, and then you can have the protesters. And it broke the military dictatorship. Hmm. So the role of the church in South Korea has been extraordinary. And one day in North Korea, it will be extraordinary too. Because if North Korea is to be rebuilt, and just as we saw the walls fall in Berlin, yes. just as we saw the end of apartheid in South Africa, just as we're seeing change in Burma, where I was a few weeks ago, uh, and Northern Ireland, where who would have thought ever we would see the kind of joint administration of r nationalists and, and loyalists coming together. Uh, nothing, none of these situations perfect, but we've seen extraordinary change in our lifetime, yeah. and I think we'll see change coming North Korea And too. you believe, I mean, the case you make in Building Bridges is that we must engage with North Korea. How do you engage with a madman, with Kim Jong-un, whom is running around saber-rattling, yeah. threatening to set off nukes, not only to the South, but also to the United States? Well, I think, first of all, <laughs> we learn the lessons of history. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher got it right. They had a strong military presence in Western Europe against the former Soviet Union. For mm -hmm. every SS-20 or SS-25 aimed at the West, there was a cruise or Pershing missile. Mm -hmm. And Reagan and Thatcher said, now, instead of mutually assured destruction, mm -hmm. MAD as the acronym had it, yeah. instead of that, how do we engage? And the Helsinki process was used to promote human rights not to appease, and you know, I'm no appeaser, mm -hmm. 200,000 people are in prison camps. This is the last Stalinist redoubt. It's just like Stalin's Soviet Union. There are wicked, terrible, egregious violations of human rights in North Korea. Terrible starvation to the people that aren't reported. Two million people died in the mass starvation in the 90s. There are regular reports of chronic malnutrition. There was even a report last year of cannibalism. Mm -hmm. So there are horrific things that occur in North Korea. Change is coming in North Korea. And the question is, will it be like Romania, where Ceausescu ended being assassinated by his own mm -hmm. previous supporters? Or will it be peaceful? Will it be like Gorbachev? Will there be mm -hmm. change? Will it be like China, where we see some change gradually coming about? So they're the options. Will it become like South Korea, which is one of the most lively democracies, the most wonderful countries on the face of this earth? Will we see the reunification of the Korean Peninsula? I don't think these are things that are just foolish hopes. I think they're things we have to work for. Yeah. And as Churchill once said, we need less war war, more jaw jaw. Three Georgia. million people died in the last Korean War. Mm -hmm. Three million, including more than 30,000 US servicemen, including a thousand British servicemen. So we don't want to go there again. Mm -hmm. uh, we must find a way to resolve this one. I want to shift gears and talk about Margaret Thatcher. You have mentioned sure. her a little bit ago. We lost her this year. I know you had a relationship with her. You brokered a meeting between she and Mother Teresa. I did. Tell me about that. First of all, your impressions and relationship with Lady Thatcher, 
and then that particular meeting that you helped Well, the strange make thing happen. was, Raymond, that when I was elected, I was the youngest member of, M of Parliament. I was also the shortest lived MP. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that on the Wednesday night before the election in my constituency in Liverpool, it was a mm -hmm. by-election to fill a vacancy, the night before, on the Wednesday night, Margaret Thatcher won the vote of confidence in the House uh -huh. of Commons. The Labour government mm -hmm. collapsed. A general election was called. I was elected the next day as an MP, so I became the shortest lived member. And I was here for two and a half days and had to contest again four mm -hmm. weeks later. Mm -hmm. So I served in the House throughout the whole of her time as Prime Minister. Now, during my by-election, she came to Liverpool to campaign in the constituency uh -huh. uh, for the Conservative candidate. And I turned a corner one day and I literally bumped into her. It was the first time we ever met. Uh, and of course, she, real, she lost her deposit. In other words, the candidate did so badly mm -hmm. that, they didn't, that she won the general election four weeks right. later. So we always laughed about this between, I mean, once mm -hmm. I had been elected. And we personally got on well. I was sad that she, she, she wasn't a supporter on the abortion issue. She voted for abortion. Mm. But she came to the House to vote with me when I opposed animal-human hybrid embryos. In fact, she arrived that evening, sat on her seat on the front bench mm -hmm. of below the gangway, as it said. And I was concerned because I thought, goodness, she rarely comes. And, and I thought, maybe she's come to vote for this. Mm -hmm. And I thought others might follow her. And I was so moved when she got up at the end of the debate and said to me, David, you're right to have done this, and I will be voting with you. And I think others followed into the lobby uh, with her be for that reason. So I was pleased about that. But mm -hmm. Mother Teresa rang me when I was promoting a, a bill to reduce the number of abortions and said, I'd like to meet the Prime Minister. Mm. So she came here. She came where you and I were earlier in, in Westminster Hall. Sure. And I showed her where Thomas More and Edmund Campion had stood trial. Mm. And the next thing I knew was that Mother Teresa was on her knees kissing the ground. And I thought, gosh, I walk through here every day. And mm. perhaps I don't really understand as much as I should. It's where Pope Benedict came, of yeah. course, during his visit. Sure. And then we had a press conference. And all the hard, tough journalists from the press gallery were there. And the first question was, well, Mother Teresa, last night you went to see the homeless. What will you be saying to the Prime Minister later today when you see her? And mm. I thought, oh, it's a trap. Mm -hmm. Because if she says, oh, I'm going to tell her she should be doing something, right. the, the headlines will be Mother Teresa attacks Attack the Prime Minister. Sword. And she just looked at them and said, you have a wonderful hall here. She said, it would make a marvelous night shelter. <laughs> and so, and she, what she was saying was, don't try and trap me. Mm -hmm. And you have so much that you should use what you've got to mm -hmm. help the homeless. And the next question was, well, mother, there are all these unwanted children. That's why we have abortion. What would you do about them? And she simply said, give them to me, give them to me. And the journalists had no more questions. So they all lined up and shook her hand as they went <laughs> out. And she went to Downing Street, where she then had half an hour with Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. She was with Margaret Thatcher. She had two of her sisters with her. And oh. the sisters said in the car, I was laughing because they said, we hope it's all right, Mother, while you were with the, the Prime Minister, we were leaving some of the miraculous medals. Oh, around the room. <laughs> around the room. <laughs> and I asked Mother Teresa how she got on with the Prime Minister. And she said, well, like all you politicians, she said, she talks a lot. And I said, well, did you manage to talk about the homeless and abortion? She said, yes. And she said, she told me that you have the welfare state, you have social security, mm -hmm. you have housing benefits, and you have all these things. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's true. And I said, How, what did you say? And she said, and I asked, but do you have love? Do you have love? Mm. And I thought, gosh, it would have been quite something to be a fly on the wall oh. between this extraordinary meeting between <laughs> Mother T and Mrs. T. The two iron ladies. <laughs> two iron ladies. Uh, <laughs> and, and anybody who knew Mother Teresa, yeah. she could be tough, particularly in a pinch. She was well, amazing, she, she formidable. Flew, she flew all the way to Liverpool on one occasion because the local very left-wing neo-communist leaders of the council in those days were trying to close down her hostel. Oh. And so she came to see them personally. I was present at the meeting. And by the end of the meeting, they were sitting there saying, what more can we do what, to help you, Mother? Would, would <laughs> so so she, she, was, uh, she said to me once, uh, and I've often recalled it, David, you're not called upon to be successful. You're called upon to be faithful. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us should, should remember that, that we all have our failings. We, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't succeed in many of the things we try to do in our personal lives or collectively, but we're called upon to be faithful. And mm. she still remains, a, a, for me, a great iconic figure. Um, I noticed that Pope Francis, when he was talking to youngsters in Buenos Aires while he was the Cardinal Archbishop there, yes. he asked them about the poor. And one of the children said, should we be like Mother Teresa? And he said, yes. And he said, and remember, she didn't 
carry a cross in her arms. She carried a baby, and in the baby you see the cross. Mm -hmm. And Mother Teresa said, you know, I wouldn't pick up a leper for a million dollars, but I do it for the love of Jesus. Mm. So we, all of us, I think, need to just mm. remember all the things that she what said an extraordinary and stood witness for. She was extraordinary. Well, and of course, it was her witness that led to the conversion of Malcolm Muggeridge, yes. um, a great journalist like yes, you. Yes, here and, in, uh, in, in Britain. It was. And you know, Malcolm had been a cynic, he'd been an atheist, and, yeah. and then he wrote something beautiful for God yeah. uh, and that was about it. Mother Teresa because she, she changed his life. Mm-hmm. No, and, and the lives of many as a result. Millions. Let's talk about this uh, terrible, brutal attack that happened here on the streets yeah. of, uh, of England, of London. Uh, drummer Lee Wrigley who was uh, savagely attacked by these men with yeah. machetes and knives. How do you deal with something like this? Is this a terrorist attack? And has, in your opinion, the British government uh, dealt with this sufficiently? Well, we've seen terrorist outrages you know, since 9-11 onwards, some in the States, some here. This was one of the worst, obviously, that's occurred. It was so brutal. It, you have to go look at the people who were responsible for this atrocity. One of them uh, had been from a Christian family. Mm -hmm. He'd been radicalized, he'd converted to Islam. They came from Nigeria originally, where every single day Christians, Protestant and Catholic, Mm -hmm. are being systematically attacked. They're being killed, their churches are being burnt down in places like Jos in northern Nigeria. And only in this last couple of days, I was with the Cardinal Archbishop uh, from Abuja, from Nigeria, where he was describing the various initiatives inside Nigeria to try and get people of reason to stand together, Muslims and Christians, to stand up against terrorism. And this was a conference organized by Cardinal Angela Scola in Milan, who's one of the great men, I think. And his trust, the Oasis Trust, which he founded Mm. 10 years ago, is trying to promote understanding between Muslims and Christians, but it's also trying to shine a light on these terrible situations, which we have turned a blind eye to in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's only when it pours over into our own country through terrible things like this shocking murder at Woolwich that we open our eyes to reality every single day. I mean, the Vatican recently said 100,000 Christians died last year alone. Mm -hmm. And the recent State Department report on violations of human rights, but the killings, systematic killings from well, from North Korea to Nigeria, in Egypt, the Coptic Church under terrible attack, the day-to-day violence in Syria, the exodus of people from Iraq. You could go on Mm -hmm. and on and on. And so often we're quiet about these things, which is why it's great that EWTN over the years have run some programs that I've been involved in, which are the Suffering Church series. I think we need to tell the story. If a faith is worth dying for, it's worth living for. It's not Mm -hmm. just that we need to speak out for people who are suffering in this way. It's because it re-evangelizes us. It means the things we take for granted, Raymond, our freedoms, our liberties, that we so, you know, we talk so much about. Mm -hmm. But do we use them to effect? Do we speak out for those who have no voice and who who don't have the chance? It's a good segue to this Youth in Asia bill that once again is here being considered by Parliament. This is what, the third time? Yes, and as I said to you before we started the interview, I'd been this morning at a meeting Mm. uh, about this new bill. And it's a former Lord Chancellor, Lord Faulkner, who's introducing it, quite a heavyweight, Mm -hmm. uh, and it does have support in parts of the House. But on the previous occasions, two previous votes, the House has voted against this because we don't want to go the Dutch and Belgian or Oregon direction. And what I don't understand is why they think they can bypass the democratically elected House, the House of Commons, where I know that there still remains a majority against any change Mm. in our law. And we're not alone in this. The British Medical Association that represents doctors throughout the country opposes a change. Mm. So do our Royal Colleges of Physicians and Surgeons. So does the hospice movement. Mm. So does the disability rights organizations. Mm. So we're not alone on this, but it's a war of attrition. It's systematic. Mm. And once you start, they'll say this is only a very small bill affecting a tiny number of people but once you do it in one or two cases, then it's all over. In Holland, that's how it started. Now, every year, there are 4,000 deaths in Holland through euthanasia, and 1,000 of those now are involuntary, in other words, without the consent of the patient. So that's where you end up. So we've got to be clear-headed and clear-sighted here. But once you start this, it will be like abortion. All those years ago, people warned, if you do it even in the most hard cases, then it will be regular on a day-by-day basis. Only 2% of all British abortions, nearly 200,000 every year, are done in 
the so-called hard cases involving yeah. rape or incest or right. disability, 98% are done under the social clause. We've had examples of women who've had up to eight legal abortions in Britain, and I recently exposed some figures that showed that three teenage girls, three teenage girls between them, had had 24 abortions. Oh. Now, what kind of start in life is that? There must be radical alternatives to the defeatism and violence that this represents, both against the unborn child, but against the young woman as well. Mm -hmm. And we've got to find answers to this. The hurting that there is in our society, the pain that there is, mm -hmm. the destruction that there's been, is something that we've got to address. And the church's job ultimately is to be a healer. Do you think this euthanasia bill will pass? <laughs> there's been a change in the composition of the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be entirely surprised. But it wouldn't then necessarily become law because it would still have to go to the House, of, the Commons. House of Commons. But this is a war of attrition. Mm -hmm. And it's about the war of trying to change attitudes. And our opponents mm -hmm. try to caricature those of us who are opposed to a change in the law as being somehow in favor of suffering or pain. Mm -hmm. I think one of the antidotes to, to this has been the hospice movement founded by Christians, not by atheists, but by Christians. If you want to die in dignity, you die in dignity in a hospice. It's mm -hmm. the journey we all have to make eventually. You don't die in dignity when you're given a lethal injection or some barbiturates mm -hmm. uh, and in a lonely unloving situation. So we don't need doctors and nurses to kill us. You change your relationship with them anyway. I mean, the argument that's always put up is, well, it's just my right, it's mm -hmm. autonomy. You commission a doctor to kill you. It's not just you any longer. Right. You've then involved a physician. You've changed his terms, her terms of reference. The Hippocratic Oath and all those things no longer then count for anything. You know, if you, if you can't heal, then don't harm. That's mm -hmm. the basic principle of medicine. It changes all of that. So that's why it's so in, such an important battle to be fought. And uh, I can assure you, that I'm not alone in this. There are, there are a lot of colleagues in the House who feel as I do. And they include some very significant lawyers and some very significant doctors. Um, and their voices, I think, are the ones that will really count in this debate. After 33 years in politics, how lasting is all of this? How well, effective long term? Well, in the end, we just pass in the night. And mm -hmm. I think that pe politicians rather take themselves too seriously sometimes, mm -hmm. Raymond. <laughs> the only thing we leave behind are our children. And they are, if we're blessed to have children, then, then that is something that we, is very precious. Uh, you do what you can on the journey. But mm -hmm. in the end, it, as Mother Teresa said, you're not called upon to be successful, but to be faithful. And I think just traveling that journey Mm -hmm. speaking out where you can, doing what you can, and then being willing to pass on the baton. But sometimes change is made in a way that uh, you, know, you, you couldn't have imagined. No one could have foreseen. Thomas More, when he stood on the scaffold here, said, I am the king's good servant, but God's mm -hmm. first. Would he have anticipated a day when Pope Benedict would be able to come and speak in the very place where he was tried? Mm -hmm. Would we have anticipated the change that has allowed Catholics to as recently as the 19th century, take their seats in Parliament to mm -hmm. be able to speak to regularly have mass here. It's not all negative. I mean, there are positive things that have been happening in society as well, mm -hmm. uh, but it's fragile, and, it, and we have to pass it on to the next generation. Here in this building, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the 19th century, one Christian stood against the slave trade. His name was William Wilberforce. Mm -hmm. It took him 40 years to change hearts and minds and the law but eventually he was successful in doing that. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we, in our smaller ways, need to be inspired by this. And you seek to pass on not only the, the notion of public service and the faith here in England, but the touchstones of that faith. Tell us about this project, this collection that you've undertaken to preserve and extend. Well, the Christian Heritage Center is, is a really key part of the re-evangelization that Pope Benedict asked us to embark upon. If you want the re-evangelization of Europe, you have to go back to the beginnings. You have to know what your own story is. Mm -hmm. But we collected over the centuries many of the precious artifacts that were illegal. So chalices that we used illegally during penal times. We have Thomas More's crucifix and the, his own, some of his own clothes. Mm -hmm. We have the rope that dragged Edmund Campion through the streets of London mm -hmm. to be hung, drawn, and quartered at, at Tyburn. We have medieval vestments. We have Mary Queen of Scots Psalter that she had with her when she was taken to the scaffold. Mm. Now, these stories and these objects tell you something about your past, which is precious. You have to know who you are. 
you have to be challenged in every generation. And so this centre we're trying to construct, where these things would then be accessible to some of the three quarters of a million children in our two and a half thousand Catholic schools in Britain, but many of whom don't know their own story, no. which secular society has no idea about. We want this to be a place that they can all come to, mm. where they can learn their story. And we want to do it in a modern way. So you'll be greeted by a hologram. The hologram will be St. Augustine of Canterbury. Huh. And you'll know the story of Trajan's Market, where Pope Gregory says, who are these slaves? And, he, and they're told, he's told they're Angles, Anglo-Saxons. He says, non angli said Angeli. They're angels. Go and evangelize them. So he sends Augustine, huh. who comes and converts the King of Kent. And as a result, Christianity spreads through England. Mm -hmm. They need to know that story. Then they've got to meet Moore and Campion and the other mm -hmm. Catholic martyrs to know the price that was paid so that we can enjoy the freedoms we have today. Lord David Alton's latest book, Building Bridges, Is There Hope for North Korea? is available in the United States on September 1st and at bookstores everywhere and online. In late July, the FBI launched Operation Cross Country, a three-day raid targeting pimps pressing children into prostitution. Over 105 teens were rescued and 150 pimps were arrested. The FBI sting brought the often forgotten problem of human trafficking into the public spotlight, at least here in America. How prevalent is human trafficking in the U.S. and abroad, and who are its victims? The answers might surprise you. Here to enlighten us is the Director of Special Programs for the U.S. Bishops Committee on Migration and Refugee Services, Natalie Lumert. Natalie, thank you for being here. Thank you. Now, let's start with why we're seeing this explosion, and I had no idea the epidemic we're talking about. 27 million people around the world enslaved in some form of human trafficking. What is caught driving this? Well, those are the estimates, first mm -hmm. of all, by the State Department. Nobody really knows. Mm. And the problem is it's very, it's not identified. Mm -hmm. Those are estimates, it's human trafficking, which is modern day slavery, has been going on for a long time. This is a breaking news story, yeah. but it's happening, it has been happening, and these are really just small numbers in the large. How series. common is this? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, it's happening right around us. It's right. happening in our localities, in right. your town. Right. How common is it? There's another estimate of 17,500 people who are trafficked into the U.S., huh. an estimate of about 300,000 American children and youth trafficked into commercial sexual exploitation. Uh. What is not known and is also should be part of the story mm -hmm. is the people who are trafficked internally who are the most marginalized, including recent immigrants. How are these people first brought in? So they come here and obviously mm -hmm. they're looking for, for a way of life, they're looking for work. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that the gateway? That could be. Uh, smuggling turns into trafficking, for oh. example. I'll explain that. So here's a story to illustrate okay. this. We helped with a situation of a young boy who was Mexican. He was Mexican. Mm -hmm. He had been abandoned by his mother in Mexico when he was eight years old. Mm. Smugglers brought him to the U.S. illegally and probably told him he would be coming here for a better life. What happened to him in reality was he was trafficked for forced labor. He was put into a situation with other youth where they were forced to sell jewelry on the streets, the streets of American cities. Uh. The traffickers would move them around from street to street. If they did not sell their quota of jewelry, yeah. they would be beaten that night. Mm. And eventually, thank God, they were identified through immigration enforcement. Mm. The case was referred to us, and that boy, I'll call him Marco, mm -hmm. he is now, thankfully, in a Catholic refugee foster care program. Uh -huh. He is studying culinary arts. He's active in his youth group. So the point I want to make here, too, is that if you provide these people hope mm -hmm. and opportunities, they, they can really turn around. And many of these youth can also then help with the prosecution as well mm -hmm. in these cases. And that's really um, exciting to see. I was stunned to see in this recent congressional hearing, uh, Congressman Ed Royce estimates that 100,000 U.S. citizen children are victims mm -hmm. of this human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Why do so few of these cases resolve positively? And w where are these people? I mean, are mm -hmm. they underground? Mm -hmm. Are they being held in, in, mm -hmm. in hidden places like this mm -hmm. creep in Cleveland who held right. these three girls for 10 years? Well, part of it is uh, traffickers 
are nefarious individuals, obviously. Mm -hmm. They go after the most marginalized. They go after who's accessible to them. One of the points in this FBI case mm -hmm. that we learned is that many of these children and youth were in foster care, were in group care. Uh. They're children who are, are, I don't know about this case in particular, but the ones who do fall into trafficking in this country, mm -hmm. they're kids who are running away from situations. Mm -hmm. So it's the children and youth that do not have stable families to begin with who are falling into these situations. Mm -hmm. And but. On the good news is that our country is now actually becoming more aware of this situation and we realize now that we have to dig beneath the surface to see this. Mm. An example of this, several years ago there were three young women, they were actually under 18, yeah. who were identified in a brothel situation, a prostitution situation. Mm. Law enforcement went in and arrested everybody for prostitution. Thankfully, it took one federal law enforcement. He dug be below the surface and he realized that those children were not there willingly. Mm. They were there in a forced prostitution situation. They had not had the protection of a healthy family situation. Mm. That's what made them susceptible to this. Yeah. And these predators target them that's and, right. and seek they them out. And then I imagine psychologically abuse yes. them as well. Yes, that's right. That's where the invisible chain that I was mentioning earlier comes in, mm -hmm. where they're using intimidation. They're using threat against family members. Oh, For example, we had a case where a woman, she actually was able to go in the community some. Ironically, some of the, these victims, you may even see them in church. Wow. But they're using this intimidation and threat, for example, in this women's case, say, well, you can leave, you can go out if you want, but keep in mind, we know where your little sister is. Oh, We're going to get her if you leave. But trafficking is also labor trafficking. Uh -huh. Sex trafficking gets a lot of media, uh -huh. but labor trafficking is there too. And how does and that work? How, you would how be you... astounded. Well, there, I get back to the marginalized populations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, from our experience, we know that some recent immigrants can be very um, susceptible to vulnerable. this. Be vulnerable yeah. to this because one, they may be wary of law enforcement. Maybe they're undocumented. Maybe mm -hmm. they don't understand how law enforcement works. They don't know about mm -hmm. calling the FBI, for right. example. Or the hotline. Exactly, the hotline. And so one case of labor trafficking that we worked on was a case of Haitian men who were in Florida and who were literally imprisoned in containers during at night and then brought to pick tomatoes during the day. In now, containers? In, in, now, it's hard to believe that this day and age in the United States this would happen, but there really are some areas of this country, traffic, trafficking is happening, for example, more and more in rural areas as well. Mm. That's, that's frightening. It frightening. is. It sounds, it sounds sensational, but no, these it, are real cases. It sounds cases. like you've never heard of I mean, it's, yeah. it, it, it sounds like fiction, but mm -hmm. of course it's happening. Mm -hmm. In 2011, the Obama administration rescinded a grant that your department worked with, and uh, from all the reports I read, not from Catholic media, mind you, the, the, the Bishop's Conference and the Refugee Migration Services are really the gold standard in dealing with victims of human trafficking. And you all were rated as such for years and years and years, which is why it was well spent federal dollars, because you knew how to get to these people and you had a network with which to, to surround them and help them and get them out of these situations. When that grant disappeared, a $15 million outreach grant, mm -hmm. one imagine that would be the end of your efforts or seriously impede it. That has not been the case. Oh, absolutely not. We are still here. The Catholic Church is amazing. It's amazing how many Catholic partners are working with us from mm -hmm. Catholic charities to religious communities in re-envisioning what we can do in the fight of human trafficking. Mm. The bishops were in this fight with human trafficking before we had that contract. We are still here, but now because of that experience, we have the expertise, the knowledge. People are coming to us. We're training people. We even are training Border Patrol about how to identify trafficking. And it's wow. been really well received. We mm. did it for free, too, by the way. It wasn't a government program. Do you feel liberated that you don't have the government dollars? Has you know, in some ways, too, because we can think now about what are the gaps that we see. Mm. You know, what we feel are there. And for example, one mm. of our initiatives is called the Amistad Movement. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yes, thank you. So Amistad is a outreach and education program where we're using the experience and the knowledge we had from the contract oh. and looking at what the gaps are 
and addressing them. Mm. So what we found is that we know what communities are most susceptible to trafficking and we're going to those communities. We're using the parishes to get to these communities because nobody has the reach of the Catholic Church in the parishes and the immigrant communities that are affected. Mm. And so we started doing trainings in these immigrant communities about trafficking, about the red flags, about how to prevent trafficking because <laughs> the immigrant communities themselves are the ones that are most likely to be able to identify and then respond so that they know how to respond and notify law enforcement. Mm -hmm. They can prevent it within their own families and communities. And an example of this, when our first training in Florida, a woman came up to us afterwards and she said, I wish I had known, I wish I had known about this before mm -hmm. this training. And she told us her story. Oh she went gosh. to the laundromat, she was looking for a job and she was doing laundry. She saw advertisement for two jobs. One was Mary Kay mm -hmm. and one was to clean houses. She didn't know what Mary Kay was, she was a recent immigrant, but she knew how to clean houses. So she called the number and they said, we'll pick you up at 8 a.m. Two men showed up in the van hmm. and she had the opportunity to escape when they stopped to get gas, hmm. but she didn't know, she didn't think about it. Hmm. She ended up being in a forced prostitution situation for two weeks. Oh, gosh. But the good news is now that she is an educator herself and she's mm. preventing it, and she's doing community outreach, and she's mm. being a leader. And in this way, we are really promoting the dignity of the human person, because mm -hmm. that's what this issue is about. And turning in tragedy church. into something good and protective of all that's society right. and, these, and these people who are vulnerable. Tell me, what can parents do? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you read this FBI report, 105 kids right. aged 9 to 17 who were involved in this prostitution, most between right. 13 and 17, but 9-year-olds, right. what do you do to protect your kids? Right. The research shows, the practice shows that the most protective factor is having healthy relationships with your children. Mm. So having trusting, stable relationships with your children. Mm -hmm. Traffickers will exploit when children do not have that. Mm -hmm. They will do things like be listening at the mall when they hear the adolescent girl complaining and fighting with her parents on the oh, phone. Boy. They will offer the alternative. We trust you. We'll we'll mm. we'll ha we'll be that figure for you. We'll be you. your support. We'll be your support. That's mm. right. And so that's the best defense: is no. strong families. It's 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 demonic in its reach. I mean, it's mm -hmm. when you hear these mm -hmm. stories, it's just. Uh, what is the next step here? What are you all planning now, as far as outreach and public awareness? Well, we really want to bring Amistad nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, we are getting very positive response. The training we just had a few weeks ago mm -hmm. in New Jersey, we had eighty. Uh, immigrants from West and African countries hmm. attend and religious uh, sisters attend mm -hmm. and they are now becoming educators yeah. and training as well. But this is really, it's, it's, it's immigrants as well as citizens who are being targeted. This affects everybody and every family. That's right, everybody oh. and especially the most marginalized mm -hmm. and it, they could be right in front of you mm -hmm. and the point is to dig deeper and to really ask questions mm -hmm. and to really see everybody as brothers and sisters too. Natalie, thank you so much thank for your you. great work. You can find out more about the USCCB's efforts against human trafficking by visiting usccb.org. Then do a search for human trafficking in the upper right corner. Our final segment this evening deals with some mature themes and viewer discretion is advised. According to statistics, one in six American women has been the victim of attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. That's well over 17 million women in the U.S. alone. Many of them carry the pain of the assault for years, telling no one. Tonight, I want to bring you the story of one woman who not only survived a sexual assault, but has found healing and hope through faith. Here's an encore of my very special interview with Dr. Marguerite Ogden. You have an interesting background with EWTN in 1989. You were, you and your family went to Birmingham, sat in the audience of one of Mother Angelica's live show, and we actually found video of you as a little <laughs> girl at the end of the show with Mother. Tell us wh what this is about, why so, you were there. Um, before the taping, she came up to um, the audience, and she came up to me and said, hi, little girl, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I put my hands on my hips, and I looked at her, and I said, I think I'm going to take over your job. <laughs> and so at the end of the show, this is, this is what happened. You know, a lot of people worry about my demise. They keep looking at me and say, how old are you, mother? I say, I'm 66 in April. And they say, wow, what's going to happen? 
<clears throat> well, tonight there's a little girl in our audience and I asked her what she wants to be. And she said, I'm going to take your place. <laughs> <laughs> so sweetheart, come up here. Come on. Come on. Come on. All of you worried about my demise, here's the future. <laughs> <laughs> right here. What's your name, sweetheart? Marguerite. Marguerite. You got beautiful eyes. You know that? Thank you. You're well. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you going to do? Bye now. <laughs> now, I, I want to move to a story, and it's, it's, it's a difficult segue, but um, seven years ago, you were on a cruise ship with a girlfriend, and a terrible event happened. Tell me about it. Yeah, um, I was in graduate school at the time, and um, I went on a cruise, like you said, with a girlfriend of mine for spring break. Mm -hmm. And we were out um, one night just talking to some people, and my friend was tired, so she went back to the cabin and went to bed early. And that night, uh, one of the men on the ship put the date rape drug into my drink. Mm. And, um, and I woke up the next morning in a pool of blood and urine with mm. black and blue marks on my arms from being held down. No memory of anything. And that's how the date rape drug works. Mm -hmm. and, and did you tell somebody about this at the time? Well, you know, the word shock is really an understatement when it comes after rape. Mm -hmm. You know, most rape survivors don't report the event. It's really, a, really, it's a, it's a mix of just terror and bewilderment that happens. Mm -hmm. And so, no, like most rape survivors, I didn't report the event on the cruise ship because my brain hadn't even fully comprehended. You can't process what can't. which just happened. You can't. And because you don't have the full memory of it, I'm sure it's even more disorienting all along. Right. Now, you come back, you were a graduate student at the time in Washington, D.C. at a university. Mm -hmm. You go to a rape crisis center did they offer any help yeah psychologically they did offer help um, you know everyone again after rape definitely needs help um, healing psychologically but spiritually I felt lost mm -hmm. yeah and you were at mass one day you started going to daily mass right and I imagine there's a lot of conflicting emotions and, and uh, from what I've read there are common reactions after a violation like this that a woman or a person goes through. Right. Tell us some of what was happening to you in the aftermath. Right. Yeah, I was going through post-traumatic stress disorder, which happens after a rape. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what happens is the brain is just so traumatized and doesn't know what to do to protect you from happening from this happening again because right. it doesn't know what even caused it. Okay. That with post-traumatic stress disorder, the brain starts to change all sorts of things about you. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, for me, I started to like different foods. You know, I gained weight. Mm. I was terrified all of the time. I was up at night. I felt disgusted toward men. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you've just gone through a horribly traumatic event. You're terrified, and then you're having to be patient with yourself because yeah. the one person in life who's constant is yourself. You know who you are. You know what foods you like. Mm -hmm. But with post-traumatic stress disorder, even that changes, and yeah. so it's it's like a living hell. Yeah, and, and and part of the reason I wanted to do this segment is because I think there are so many women, men as well, who go through these traumatic moments, and they are filled with shame. They're filled with um, anxiety over what happened. They're trying to piece it together. And so many, according to the reports and the statistics, so many of these cases go unreported. Yeah. They simply keep it to themselves and carry it around like baggage. What I loved about your story is you found a way not only to heal psychologically, but spiritually, and, and it brought you to, to wholeness. You started going to daily mass. Tell me what happened. You were in the middle of a mass one day, yeah. and you had sort of a vision. Yeah. Um you know how God works. I just so happened to have a break in my schedule at the mm -hmm. same time there was daily mass. And so I was going, I was going every day. And um, after the rape happened, when the priest would hold up the host and say, this is my body, mm -hmm. um, I would have a very vivid vision of Jesus in my head, naked, uh, lying mm -hmm. in a pool of blood and urine mm -hmm. with black and blue marks on his arms. Mm -hmm. And at first I was disgusted and I didn't even understand it. And then I realized that Jesus was in the exact same position I was in after the rape. Mm -hmm. And that by that vision, Jesus was telling me, you know, even though he couldn't stop the rape from occurring due to the other person's free will, mm -hmm. he suffered with me in a very real sense that mm -hmm. it was his body that was raped too. Mm -hmm. 
And when the priest would hold up the host and say, this is my body, Jesus was telling me, you know, this is also my body. Yeah, yeah. and so you were full communion with him, in a full communion. Tell me how that event was the catalyst for the healing that you eventually found. What happened as a result of that moment? Yeah. Um, you know, um, one other thing that happened after, after that was um, while reading the Bible, another way God helped me heal was He really spoke to my heart and kind of told me that, um, you know, you are Jerusalem and women who are raped are Jerusalem. Hmm. You know, just like the city of Jerusalem, which is, you know, has wars and rapes and pl is plundered, um, Jerusalem has a very special plan in the Lord's um, mind. You know, there are many Bible verses about Jerusalem being the jewel in His crown. Right. And, um, you know, Jerusalem is precious to the Lord, as are women who are raped. Mm. Um, so you're absolutely right. There was a retreat that followed. Um, I was talking to one of my girlfriends named Raquel, who's a speaker, speaker for Project Rachel. Mm. And um, I was kind of wanting some empathy, and I said very sarcastically, isn't it nice how the Catholic Church does all this for women who've had abortions and nothing for women who've been sexually assaulted? Mm. And so she looked at me pretty sternly and said, well, maybe you should do something about that. And you did. I, yeah, so I talked to my spiritual director and she led me to a Cedar Break Catholic Retreat Center in Austin. Okay. And so I worked with them to help develop a retreat for women who had been sexually assaulted. And um, Bishop Gregory Amen was the bishop of Austin at the sure. time. And he heard about the idea and loved it. And he sent uh, some of their staff members to a conference on post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And they put on this beautiful retreat called Healing Hearts. Huh. Yeah. And, and tell me about Healing Hearts. What is the form? And, and again, we, we want to make this resource available and let more people know about this because, as I said, so many people, I think, carry the burden of this. And they feel they have no place to go, even in the Catholic setting, to find the sort of spiritual healing that only the church really can provide them right. with. So tell me about this Healing Hearts program. What happens there? What form do these retreats take? Yeah, um, you know, Healing Hearts was just so beautiful. I was one of the people who attended, and there were about 30 women at the first retreat. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the beautiful thing about it is that women were aged 16 to about 75. Mm -hmm. um, all races, some of them pregnant, and all of them carrying very deep wounds. Um, some of the older women had been carrying them since childhood and never have told anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, but still searching for healing. And so we really, um, we shared our story, we found community, we received the sacrament of the anointing of the sick because that's more than for just physical illness. Uh. Um, we were given blessed teddy bears to sleep with at night mm -hmm. since a lot of us are fearful at night, a lot of women who've been raped. Mm -hmm. And we really all experienced God's um, love and healing in a very profound way. Mm. Now, has this been replicated in other places? I'm sure, I know the attendance at these retreats have been pretty high. Right, they have been. And, you know, um, not that I'm aware of, they haven't been replicated, mm -hmm. but it's such a need in our church. You know, like you said, one in six women is an awful lot of women, and a mm -hmm. lot of them end up leaving the church. Church. And so, you know, a great resource um, for dioceses or retreat centers or bishops who are interested in this. Mm -hmm. um, at Cedar Break Retreat Center, Bev Collin and Brian Egan both mm -hmm. um, have done this retreat multiple times and, you know, know the format. So anyone who's interested in doing a retreat like this wouldn't have to start from scratch. Right. They have a curriculum for the retreat, yeah. a shape, a form for it that right. could be shared. Uh, what is the role of men in this healing? Because uh, when the male is the perpetrator uh, and the aggressor here, I imagine, at least in the first immediate aftermath, you don't want to see a man, you don't want to talk to a man, and you don't trust men. Right. Men are just uh, imperative in healing. I mean, if you're a man who knows a woman who's been sexually assaulted, you have a very, very special place. A lot of men get nervous from sexual assault. They don't want to hear about it. They, they, they think that the woman doesn't want to be, you know, even around men. But, um, you know, I had a very special male friend named Chris who helped me so much this time in my life because where there is desolation, there also has to come healing from that same place. Mm -hmm. And men can bring strength in a very gentle way, which is exactly what women who've been sexually assaulted need. 
So my friend Chris, every single day, would text me and tell me he was thinking of me, and if I wanted to talk, he was available. So he was never pushy. And um, at night, when I was up, because I was terrified at night, he would always answer the phone and talk to me. And he was such a constant sort of a source of strength mm. um, that he helped me heal towards men so much. Well, we have a call, Agnes from Oregon. Your question, Agnes. Hello there. This is a question for Margaret. Okay. I have not heard her mention, I don't think I did, but uh, about if she has spoken to her parents about this. Mm -hmm. Have you spoken to your parents about this? What's the role of parental support? Yeah, um, parental support obviously is, is incredibly important. I did tell me f my family about the rape after mm -hmm. it occurred. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, fam I have two brothers who are lawyers, and so yeah. family members just are so angry they want to take control of the situation. Mm -hmm. They're so mad at the person. But after a woman has experienced a rape, she's lost all control over her life. And mm -hmm. so you know, I had to tell my family to back off. They had the best of intentions, but, mm -hmm. you know, a woman who's been raped needs to control the situation because mm -hmm. they've just lost all control. Right, right. And there's, there's also that component where after the, after the abuse, th there is a common theme. You see it in a lot of the literature and reportage on the subject. At times, the women were returned to the perpetrator and initiate a relationship with him because they, I imagine, they're trying to take some control over what happened. You're absolutely right. And, you know, it sounds bizarre to people who've never been raped or experienced mm -hmm. rape, but even after I was raped, I had the thought of going back to the man who had raped me mm -hmm. and having sex with him consensually, which, again, is bizarre, and thank God I did not. But so many women who are raped just are so traumatized, they don't know what they can do to... Um, get some control back over their life. Mm -hmm. And so they think somehow that if I have sex with this person... You can exercise the event in the past. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't work out. It just it adds more scars and more hurt. What would you advise, what would you tell women, and no doubt some of them are looking in tonight, who have suffered from a rape or a sexual assault? Yeah, um, for any women who've been sexually assaulted, I mean, I just want to say to them, first of all, it doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what people said to you afterward. It doesn't matter what you did afterwards. Mm -hmm. It was not your fault. Yeah. And Jesus loves you. He suffered with you. He wants to heal you. You are precious to him. And all I can say is just come back to Jesus. Mm. Tell me about Healing Hearts, and that's, that's what this retreat is called. And uh, do, you, do you hope, I know it's going to happen. A lot of people are going to try to contact you and uh, Cedar Break retreat center right. because they're going to want access to this. Yeah. Uh, give me a sense of what this does to the people who take part in it, this retreat. It's just, um, you know, it rebuilds a sense of trust because after an ass a, a sexual assault, you know, what happens is you just can't understand how your loving creator would um, allow such personal physical violence. Mm -hmm. You just can't, can't comprehend it. And this retreat just like like the name that they chose said, it, it heals hearts. You know, your your heart is broken, and the person who matters to you most is your God. Mm -hmm. You know, and when that's um, when that's been broken, there's nothing else to do but heal. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm delighted you you came on. I know how difficult this is to talk about, and I also know there are a lot of people who'd rather just avoid the topic. But it is so ubiquitous in society today. I thank you for your bravery coming on. Thank you. For your candor. And, uh, and your strength, and I'm, I know it will change and touch so many lives. Margaret Ockham, so. thank you for being here. We'll stay in touch. If you would like more information on the Healing Hearts Retreat for Survivors of Sexual Assault at Cedar Break Catholic Retreat Center in the Archdiocese of Austin, Texas, or Diocese of Austin, Texas, call Brian Egan at 254-780-2436, 254-780-2436. Three, six. Or you can email Marguerite directly. You're going to regret this, Marguerite. At Marguerite, M-A-R-G-U-E-R-I-T-E, -E, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N, at gmail.com. That's all the time we have. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. The Twitter and Facebook pages are linked on the left-hand side of the site, and I keep you updated throughout the week. You can also sign up for my weekly e-blasts on the website. Be sure to tune in next week. We have much more for you. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. 
On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank you.